thanks everybody for having me here. Um, y you know, it's not my first APS, uh, and in the previous APS uh, in London and in New York, we talked about a lot of things, um, DCO, playable ads, uh, retargeting. Um, there's a lot of topics. Today I want to cover incrementality and, and sort of uh, the right way to set up a campaign, a retargeting campaign, uh, how to think of um, just a setup in terms of uh, attribution windows, things like that. Obviously, it's a very complex topic, so I'll do my best to keep it short. And then uh, if we want to continue the conversation, we can always do it later on. So uh, today, mainly three things. Um, you know, just a basic um, recap of what is retargeting. Um, I know a lot of people here in the room are already running retargeting campaigns. Um, you know, a lot of you also have heard of retargeting, but are not actively running retargeting campaigns. So um, I really want to just briefly recap on what is retargeting um, and then talk about incrementality uh, or A-B test or uplift. Or there's a few ways to call this. Uh, and then just uh, talk about the most common bad retargeting setup that I've seen uh, across many different clients. And uh, we can dive right in. Uh, if the clicker is with me, of course, today. There you go. Uh, so um, a quick recap, what is retargeting? Uh, essentially, um, you know, you have an app called your app to be very original. You want to, um, you have a lot of existing users and you want to make sure that those existing users, the ones that installed your app, you want to make sure that they spend time and money in the app. So you want them to basically make sure that they open your app regularly, that they spend money in it, and they become recurrent users, recurrent purchasers. Um, one way to do this is uh, through a retargeting display campaign. You would display ads on other apps, and then those apps we deep link straight to your app. So if I'm a user and I search for, um, uh, you know, I want to buy a shoe, I go to your app. If you're a shopping app, I, uh, I look for a shoe, I don't buy it, and then I see an ad for your shoe on some other app that I'm using. I click on the ad and it directs me, deep links me directly to your app. Um, automatically brings me to the right section and I can just tap to buy the shoe. Um, so very sort of simple setup um, about you know, retargeting campaigns. Uh, now the issue with, so the principle of retargeting is that you spend money, you spend your money to bring users, your existing users back to your app and then you measure how much money they've spent. It could be money, it could be something else like time spent, but you measure the money that users spend in your app, and then you, can, you sort of compare those two. Um, and often, in, so there's are different ways to call it. You can call it return on investment. You can call it return on ad spend. They're not the same thing, but um, often the term at least is, uh, is the same. And so you would measure uh, your spend and see if you're doing a good job or not. If you're driving more revenue than you are driving spend, you're doing a good job. And that's the biggest sort of misconception. Um, it's actually not the case. Uh, well, for retargeting, um, the way to calculate your return on investment on a retargeting campaign is definitely different than the way to calculate it on a UA campaign. So UA retargeting are completely different things because by definition, retargeting means re uh, displaying ads to users who already have your app. And so there's a, there's a really big misconception. And we see a lot of, a lot of advertisers who, who think they're doing a great job, and they, they probably are for most of it. Uh, but in terms of the retargeting, they th they're spending a lot of money. They think they're generating extra revenue, while in fact they're losing money, uh, quite literally. Uh, and that's the, that's the danger of, uh, of retargeting. So retargeting, return on ad spend, um, is basically doesn't mean, a lot, doesn't mean anything without measuring incrementality without measuring uplift um, or through an A-B test. So a very simple example, I don't want to go through like every single metric, but two uh, different setups. Uh, one on the right, I think this is a pointer, the one here, no retargeting. So you're not running any retargeting campaign. You just have your app. Uh, you have 100,000 users in your app. You're, you're spending $0 on retargeting. And those users, they spend 18K in your app. So nothing extra to say there. That's just the base setup. And then let's say you want to start a retargeting campaign. So you still have your same users, and you want to start, uh, you know, uh, spending spending money on uh, on your existing users. So you spend 10k on a retargeting campaign, and you, you measure attribution, um, and you see 18k in revenue, and 
if you ignore this for a sec, the left part, you just focus on your retargeting campaign, you see, okay, I spent 10K, it generated 18K in revenue, so my return on ad spend is, is 1.X. And actually, a lot, of you, a lot of people, a lot of clients, a lot of advertisers actually um, look at it this way. And, and for obvious reasons, uh, you know, this metric is, first of all, it's wrong, and second of all, it's to measure your real ROI, and it's... Uh, it, not only is it wrong, it's dangerous because you think you're doing a good job, so you're scaling your spend. Instead of spending 10K, you're going to spend uh, 50K, and then you start seeing not great things, and, uh, and you, you sort of wasted a lot of time, a lot of money, and you don't really know why that happened. Um, so the, the trick is obviously to, to count only the purchases that were driven from the retargeting campaign and not the whole revenue. And the way to do this is incrementality. So incrementality shows you how users would have performed without the retargeting campaign while running a retargeting campaign. So incrementality shows you basically the difference uh, of your retargeting campaign and the, the, your existing users by themselves. Or to put it another way, it shows the extra, extra revenue driven thanks to the retargeting campaign. So there are many different ways to set up uh, incrementality and, and uplift and, and sort of A-B test. Again, there are a few different ways, a few different names. There are a, a few different uh, setups. We can't uh, go through all of them just because it's, uh, it's, it would be a very long talk. But um, I would say the most common way to do this is to think of a control group and a target group. So control group is an, uh, half your, uh, like half or a certain percentage of your audience, ideally half of your audience where you don't show any ads. Um, and again, there's a lot of different ways. There's PSA, holdout group. Like, uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but in this case, in this setup, control group means no ads shown from your, ad, from your brand. Um, the target group is the, use, uh, is the group of users that you're allowed to show ads to. If you cut that in uh, half and half, um, at the end of the campaign, you basically can measure the revenue driven by your users in the control group, so the one on the, the, one on the left here, and you measure the revenue on the target group, and you can basically compare those two, and that gives you the uplift or the uplift in revenue, the incremental revenue that was driven thanks to the retargeting campaign. Uh, the, that value here is the real way to sort of calculate your ROI. That's the, that's the real and only way to, to figure out how much revenue did the retargeting campaign drive. Um, the, if I go back uh, here a quick sec, uh, we're talking about revenue here, but you can actually do this on signups. You know, how many users signed up on the control group, how many users signed up in the target group. You can um, look at tutorial completed. You can look at, uh, you know, uh, any sort of um, metric that you're tracking through your tracking partner, and you can uplift, you can measure the uplift on that KPI. And so th this is actually really important for a retargeting campaign. This is what actually tells you, all right, we're doing a good job, or, you know, or <laughs> we're just uh, wasting money. So we, we talked about incrementality, and, and we're still going to talk about it, but the, um, one of, one of the, the misconceptions as well is that at least that's what I hear a lot, is, is I don't want to target my active, within a retargeting campaign, I don't want to retarget my active users. I want to wait, you know, seven days. So I want to give them a chance to perform by themselves. And then when I see that they're not performing, I start a retargeting campaign on them. Um, and that means waiting whatever, one day or seven days or 30 days, maybe just to focus on lapsed users. Uh, but basically waiting a good amount of time giving them a chance to perform on their own. And if they don't perform on their own, if those users don't actually perform on their own, then start retargeting them. And that's, the, that's uh, a setup that I've heard about a lot. And, um, and um, here's sort of an, an analogy that I use a lot in, in sort of any, uh, any meeting that I have is, um, it's an analogy using a restaurant. So let's say instead of owning an app, you own a restaurant. And what you're saying is, if you have, we had a lot of fun making these animations, by the way, so I hope you're enjoying them. Um, 
you have somebody walking in front of your restaurant and um, some, you know, some users will come in the restaurant, some users will walk away. Uh, on the top part, uh, so here, uh, you don't have, assuming you don't have any retargeting campaign in place. So users will walk in front of the restaurant and they will walk away from your restaurant. You don't have any retargeting in place, so they just walk away forever. Um, that's one user. Another user can walk in front of your restaurant, actually like what they see, and enter the restaurant, and they start spending money in your app. That's without retargeting. With a wrong setup in retargeting, at least one that I see often here on the bottom, here we have uh, somebody walking in front of your restaurant, and in case you don't see, this is one mile after the restaurant, and this is two miles or two kilometers after your restaurant. So here you, you basically say, okay, let's give them a chance to perform by themselves. Let's give them a chance to enter the restaurant by themselves. And if they don't enter the, the restaurant, let's give them 30 days. So in this case, it's an analogy in kilometers. So let's give them one kilometer, one mile, before we start retargeting them. So let's give them um, a good amount of time to walk away from the restaurant, and then let's try to bring them back. So they're walking away from the restaurant, and then they see an ad for your restaurant. And I mean, I don't know if you walk a lot in Berlin, but I would never walk back one kilometer for a restaurant. And it's the same exact sort of uh, mentality for apps. In this case, I used, um, I used a, a restaurant example. That's the analogy that I like to use. Uh, a friend of mine actually uses another analogy. Um, it's, uh, so basically, in, uh, you think of your uh, marriage, for those of you who are married, and uh, he basically says, if uh, you're waiting for your wife to divorce before going to the gym, then it's too late. And here is the exact same thing, right? If you're waiting for the user to leave forever, then it's too late. And, uh, and this is really one of the misconceptions um, of, of uh, retargeting. And so, in this case, the right way to set it up is to focus on that, that user. He walks in front of your restaurant, doesn't enter the restaurant, but you basically show him an ad right after. Um, so as soon as they leave your app, you show them an ad. And usually what clients say is, yes, but I don't want to show ads to users that are active because they're going to perform by themselves. And, and then the real question becomes, so how do you know which, which revenue was driven because of the retargeting campaign and which revenue was driven by the just organic flow? And the solution is incrementality, right? We talked about it earlier. So the way to, if you set it up this way, if you set up your retargeting campaign with re-engaging active users, then the only way to measure the real efficiency of the campaign is to measure incrementality. And so you're going to basically have two, two setups, one where you're not running retargeting, one where you are running retargeting. And, uh, and even if you're re-engaging active users, it's OK. You're not wasting money because you're measuring the incrementality. And, and my message here is really to focus on, uh, on comparing the two instead of waiting for them to leave, and then measuring ROAS there, or return on ad spend there. So in this case, they walk back to your restaurant, they spend money in, in your restaurant or in your app, and therefore, you know, you're extremely happy, and you can scale, and everybody's happy. So um, again, like there, there are um, three things I want to, I want to sort of um, to talk before I leave. So the first thing, the control group, there are a few different ways to set it up. Uh, you know, control group and target group. You can do PSA, uh, public service announcement. So instead of just holding back a group and not showing them anything, uh, you can also uh, show them ads for um, uh, public service announcements. So Red Cross or actually any you know charity of your choice. And you can show ads for a charity and compare those two. Um, you can look at the at the exposed versus unexposed in a, in a specific quarter. Like, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, I'm not going to have time to cover all of these. Um, but you need some sort of incrementality measurement to measure the retargeting campaign. Um, the, second, the second set of item, it's don't wait for your users to leave. 
don't wait for your users to churn before you start re-engaging them. It's re-engagement is an ongoing activity and it's something you do as they use the app to make sure that you stay top of mind and then to make sure that you're, uh, you know, they, they think about you and they will immediately think of you uh, uh, when they want to order something. Um, an example in this case I'd like to give is, is uh, um, a lunch, ordering food, right? So when you order food, at what time do you actually decide what you're going to eat for lunch? Is it at 6 a.m. when you wake up or at 8 a.m.? I don't know. When you wake up or is it at 9 a.m. when you get in the, in the office or is it at 10 a.m.? Um, you know, when you have a coffee break or is it at 11.59 right before going to lunch? And so it, it's really, it, there's not one deciding factor of, you know, where you're going to decide to have lunch. It's influence, influencing the user to actually make that decision. So you want to retarget them uh, as an ongoing basis to make sure that they actually purchase your product. Um, and then the, the sort of third, third um, takeaway is really uh, uh, thinking of your control group. Like, there's a lot of people actually that run incrementality but they, with a control group, but they just don't define the control group properly. So a few sort of tips, and again, I'm happy to talk about it more afterwards, but a few tips. Um, one is it needs to be the same audience in the control group and the target group. So this is an obvious one, but it gets a little bit tricky. Same audience means if you can't just compare users who saw an ad and users who didn't see an ad. Um, it's not as simple because the users who saw an ad, they're not in the same audience as the users who didn't see the ad because users that didn't see the ad, they might not be active on RTB network. They might not be using other apps. You know, there's a reason why they didn't see your ads in the first place. So one sort of uh, really important rule is to make sure that the audience in your control group and the target group is exactly the same. Another uh, sort of uh, obvious one yet important is to um, have a statistically valid number of users in both groups. Um, if you have, it's okay if you have 80% of your audience in the control group or in the target group and 20% of your audience in the control group. It's okay if it's not the same number because you're going to compare on a per user level, but it's important to focus on um, a number, to pick a number that's high enough that, it's, uh, that it makes sense for, for the control group. Obviously, if you pick five users in the control group, it doesn't make any sense. Um, another one you can think of is, um, is uh, sort of a whale exempt, um, you know, for, especially for gaming, but for other titles, uh, for other categories, um, you know, whales can offset your incrementality, so it's something to think about. Uh, it's not necessarily something that breaks your uplift measurement, but it's just things to think about when you're running a valid, like a control group for it to be valid. Um, so all of those things is what it takes to have a proper incrementality test and therefore a proper retargeting campaign. Time, I don't want to get over time here, so I, um, we're, sitting, we're sitting outside at Addictive booth. Um, if there are any questions with, uh, you know, as regards to incrementality, the control group, what's the attribution window, uh, what's the re-attribution window, um, you know, DCO, like any sort of item or topic you want to cover uh, on a like one-to-one -one basis, happy to talk about this uh, on, on the booth. And uh, I'll, let, uh, I'll let the mic to James, and I hope you're enjoying your... Uh, your APS today, and then I'll get see you. I'll see you outside in a sec. Thanks, everybody.